Hello everyone and welcome to this Law Society Gazette Jobs and JMC Legal Recruitment Webinar on Career Planning for 2021. I am Rita Oscar, Manager of the Law Society's Career Service. I'd like to take a few moments to tell you how the Law Society's Career Service is here to support you throughout your career. We have several products and services to provide support from pre-qualification right through to supporting you at various stages of your career once qualified. It could be that you want advice on qualification, changing career direction, returning following a career break, etc. Um, we are here to support you through that. Amongst other things, we offer one-to-one -one advice via our free career clinics, which are led by qualified legal career coaches. On the Law Society website, you'll find career guidance and further information on our services, or you can always email us at careers at lawsociety.org.uk. Please also remember you can register with Law Gazette jobs and receive tailored job alerts across all practice areas and locations. Before I hand over to Jason Connolly and Sean Nicholson from JMC Legal Recruitment, we would ask you to please participate in today's session by asking questions in the chat box, which you'll find at the top left of the screen. If you have any technical issues, please post these in the chat box and one of our team will respond to you via private message. I hope you find the session useful. Thank you to those who sent questions in advance and I will now hand over to Jason. Hello, good morning, everybody. It's great to have you with us today. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Um, my name is Jason Connolly. Thank you, Rita, for that introduction. I'm CEO of JMC Legal Recruitment. We're the UK's number one ranked legal recruitment agency. We do a lot of work um, at partner level. We move teams around the city of London, and we also work internationally. And um, we're here today, both myself and Sean, who will introduce himself shortly, to help you in your career and to give you as much advice as we possibly can. We're going to really make the most of this hour. What I'd encourage you to do at the start, if you have any question, no question is too small. Please go to the right hand side chat box and submit your question and we will get through as many of these as we possibly can in this next hour. I'm really excited to help you all and thanks so much to the Law Society uh, for putting this event on today. It is the third one we've had and both the last two were extremely successful. I'll hand over to Sean so he can introduce himself to you. Um, over to you, Sean. Hello, I'm the Managing Director of JMC. Um, I joined JMC in 2017. So since then, my role has been to build the London team. So now we stand as one of the leading London teams. We have, I think, eight, soon to be nine recruiters on London, covering everything from partner moves across the city, West End, boutiques, to associate and paralegal, legal secretary support roles all over London, whether that's the city, West End, Greater London, etc. So I specialise in, as Jason said, partner and team moves across the city. It's just something I've sort of built up over the last few years in an area and a level that I've sort of become quite well known in. So I've placed highly regarded partners and teams with top city firms, West End firms and boutique firms as well. And I continue to do so whilst also being managing director of JMC, which means that I train a lot of the consultants that we have coming through, which we are passionate about training and giving as much input as we can to help the consultants we have to help everybody else in the market, whether it's clients or candidates alike as well. So they're all very competent and they're all trained to a very high standard. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, it's worth saying as well, between uh, Sean and I, we've placed thousands of candidates over the years um, into different roles um, with our team working under us as well. So there's probably not too many uh, things that we haven't come across um, in, in the legal industry and with moving people. But what we really specialise in is helping people to understand their full potential and how to apply themselves in their career. So um, that's a bit about us. We're going to kick straight off uh, with some of the questions. Please do use the chat box on the right. Submit those questions early and we will get to them and we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can. So the first pre-submitted question is what is the best way to secure a remote in-house role? This individual said I was previously head of legal, so already have in-house experience, but for practical reasons would prefer an in uh, would prefer a remote role. 
The good news is, um, as a result of the pandemic, um, more and more and more employers are becoming open-minded about remote working. If they weren't already so before um, the pandemic, they definitely are now. And we've seen a real significant increase um, in companies that are going to be offering agile working and remote working moving forward. Um, so that's one, one great thing that's come from the pandemic. And actually, um, speaking about the job market in general, it's really busy at the moment. There is no shortage of roles in the legal industry, more so at the senior level. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunity out there. So talking about this question, then uh, remote roles, I would quite simply go on to the job boards and start looking um, at roles that offer remote working. Most of the job boards now will actually have a filter that you can select which will um, make sure that the only jobs you see are um, remote working roles. The, the, when it comes to in-house roles, that it is extremely competitive. Um, we, if, if, if I was to have a pound for every time we had someone call up for an in-house role, there is a lot of demand for these positions, more so than private practice. When we put out an in-house job advert, on average, we see 150% more applications than we do of that private practice. So you need to be on the ball when it comes to looking for in-house roles, because sometimes when they're put up, they're taken down within a matter of days. Um, so it's really, really important to be on the ball. What I would do is I would go to all the main job boards and I would sign up for job alerts. And uh, rather than get flooded every day by a mountain of jobs, use the filters on the job boards um, to actually pinpoint what it is that you want. So tick the, the options for remote work and tick the options for um, general counsel, legal counsel, all of those kind of associated um, positions. And then every day in your inbox, you should get a, a fresh um, set of emails with the best opportunities in the market. You can go to all the top uh, legal job boards. That's the way I would handle the search. I don't think you're at a disadvantage with remote working. The only thing you'd need to really think about is how are you gonna integrate into the team? um as well being remote but i think a lot of companies have really given this a lot of for a lot of companies now are going out of survival mode and really starting to think about how is it we're going to drive business growth in 2021 um so i i hope that answered that question i'm going to hand this next one over to sean um sean your question is uh what are the most important elements of a career plan i think everyone has different goals don't they and i think this will change throughout your career so my advice and i think this is advice i've also been giving myself would be to put together a five to ten year career plan in the first instance obviously your career will go on longer than that but you need to think about the mid to sort of long term now so what i would do is set out plans about where it is you want to be so whether that's a partner at a city firm a west end firm a boutique firm whether you want to go in house and become a general counsel or head of legal, then what you need to do is map out how you're going to do this and work backwards from that. So what do I mean by that? I mean, every look at every step and every step it takes to reach where you want to be and try and reach one step by step. So these things don't happen overnight. Of course they don't. But if you put the right plans in place now to get there, then of course this can make things happen sooner. So I think it's important every year maybe every six months actually to look at where you're up to with your plans and what it is you've achieved in that period of time so every half year maybe look at right where am i up to in terms of billings in terms of business development if you're in-house how are you integrating with the business in general the company the culture etc because you need to make sure all these things align with what it is you need to achieve your goals so one thing or one important bit of advice from from, from me and from everyone that I sort of know as well would be to surround yourself with others that have done this so if you work say you're an associate at a firm in the city well speak with a senior associate ask them how they got there what they put in place to make that step to becoming a senior associate and then when you become a senior associate then you should be speaking to partners or junior partners and asking them what it is you need to do and how long it took them to get there as well so i think one really important thing here is being mentored by the right people so if you're not mentored by the right person, you may be making steps that aren't leading you in the right direction. So surrounding yourself with positivity, having those people mentor you and having advice at all steps is really, really important for you to achieve the goals that you want. And then obviously if they do change, 
and in five years time you think you know what i don't want to become a partner i want to go elsewhere then obviously you can change your career plan but then keep doing that yearly review and six monthly review as well to make sure you're getting there great thank you sean i think some really good advice there i think what, what you said in regards to positivity and mindset it is really important. I actually host a podcast called the Career Success Podcast. Do check it up on iTunes um, called the Career Success Podcast. We actually talk a lot about mindset. We talk to multimillionaires, people who've set up their businesses. And mindset, I believe, is absolutely key when it comes to business. Yes, we all have knockbacks, but you've got to pick yourself up and learn from those experiences. And I know myself, I've had a multitude of knockbacks over the years. But if you come back in the right way, that can really help. Great advice there, Sean. Um, so next question, there's some great questions coming in. I can see those now, so I'm looking forward to answering some of those. Um, next question, I would like to secure a hybrid role combining law and sustainability. I am undertaking a part-time master's in sustainability with Cambridge University. How can I best position myself when I am an experienced lawyer, but relatively new to sustainability? Um, a good question, you are going to a great university, so that's a, a good start uh, when it comes to looking for your role. Um, the fact that you're an experienced lawyer, uh, but you're new to sustainability, um, the way I look at that is you've just added another string to your bow, which is great. Um, I would, again, be looking at job boards, but what can you do to get yourself ahead of the game and make sure you get that role in sustainability? What I would start doing is actually sit down with a notepad and actually work out what role is it you want in sustainability? What is it you want to do? Is it you want to work for um, a charity? Is it you want to work for an organization that specializes in it? Is it you want to work in private practice specializing in that area of law? Once you've kind of got down a tailored list of what it actually is that you want to do, what I would then start doing is thinking about who is it that I need to network with in order um, to secure your right role. Because the thing is, when you're just looking for active jobs that come on the market, you're probably only looking for a certain, there's only a certain percentage of the opportunities out there that do come onto the market. But a lot of time, and a lot of the time, um, by networking with the right people, um, they might see potential in you and say, actually, do you know what, we'd really like to have you join our organisation. So what you could do is first start looking, once you've got that tailored list, right, let's just say, for example, you want to work in private practice doing sustainability, start getting together a target list of partners that you can maybe reach out to, approach, and then you can start having conversations with them. I know Sean's going to speak about the power of LinkedIn in just a moment, um, but um, LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. It, it is Anyone that joins LinkedIn generally is on that platform for a reason, that on that platform because they want to network. So don't be afraid to reach out to people. But for this particular individual, what I would first of all do, get together a career plan, what it is uh, that you actually want to do in sustainability, and then start reaching out and making uh, professional acquaintances and even better making friends in that area of law and ask them for their advice. Say, listen, you're in the type of job that I am actually looking for. What advice would you give to me? Is there any hiring coming up in your company? And it, by investing that time, I think you'll be really surprised by the results that you can harness from that. Um, Sean, a question for you, another pre-submitted question. Uh, please keep your questions uh, coming in. We're going to start whizzing through these um, uh, very shortly. Um, another pre-submitted question. Um, should I be approaching employers directly via LinkedIn if I see a role I like? Leads nicely on from the last question. Yeah, I think my advice here would be in the first instance, if you can find a direct email address and send through a CV with a with a detailed email describing um, you why you're applying for the role, that could hold a little bit more weight than just sending a message and that popping up in the corner of somebody's screen. I think it's something that happens with us as well. Um, people do contact me on LinkedIn every single day and I get so many messages where sometimes it takes me a while to go through them, but then if it's in my inbox, that's on my screen, I can see that straight away, so it's not sort of flooding my inbox. So my advice would be if you can do that and you can find your email address, then of course, um, apply that way. But if it's an in-house role, of course, it could be difficult to find email addresses as opposed to if it's within, within private practice. So most employers will want to know more about you and your skills before they'll reply to an application. Naturally, they want to see exactly what it is you've done, how many years PQE you are, and then what it is you're sort of looking to do next. So if that isn't something you can do, then of course, LinkedIn, as Jason said, is very, very powerful. Um, I think most lawyers, except for 15% of them, are on LinkedIn. So the network there is huge. You always want to be building your network. 
So if you do apply through LinkedIn, then obviously make sure, well, actually there's, there's different ways you can apply. If the job is live on LinkedIn and they've posted a job on LinkedIn, then you can actually submit your CV through that. And there's other ways of doing it. You can submit your CV or you can send over your profile. This is why having a detailed LinkedIn profile is important. What One thing I think we find is a lot of lawyers out there don't have very detailed LinkedIn profiles. So this isn't actually useful for recruiters either, just so this, this may be something to bear in mind. If you've done a training contract and you've done conveyance in family, corporate commercial litigation, and then you've gone on to be a corporate lawyer, then our searches, our backend searches, will then push up that you've done conveyance and et cetera. So you want to target your LinkedIn profile to being a corporate lawyer or whatever it is you specialize in. I think going on LinkedIn and applying direct to roles will eliminate the competition as well, because some people will apply on job boards and wait till the, um, the role does come live there as well. So I think we make a lot of placements by going proactively to the markets. So a lot of the roles that I place, well, they're, they're not even roles. A lot of the firms that I place with, a lot of the partners and teams I place, there won't necessarily be a live opportunity for them. It's about me having good relationships with the firms that I work with and making sure that I keep them in the loop should a partner in litigation come onto the market that they've been looking for. So the importance of LinkedIn is, yeah, it's it's up there with, with the most important network you can have. I would always recommend building your network as well because the amount of roles that I've been given or seen on LinkedIn with firms that I've never heard of before, then I do a little bit more digging and realize, well, this firm really do punch well above their weight just by growing my network and certain partners from the city or West End firms, they open up their own firm. If you're not building your network and staying proactive on LinkedIn, you could be missing out on that life-changing opportunity for you. So, yeah, I agree with Jason. The power of LinkedIn is incredible. I, I do agree. I've managed to build um, a personal brand on LinkedIn, which has really um, been life-changing. But it's something that you've got to put the effort into, like everything else. If you just uh, join the platform, but you don't use it, you don't engage with it, you don't um, start um, talking to your audience, that, then you're not really going to uh, reap any rewards from it. Like anything in life, you've you've got to put the effort in. If you put the effort in, then um, it's all going to, um, you know, uh, rewards will start being reaped. Um, uh, another question here. I'm a I am a mature student, having just completed my master's in sports law with a distinction. At 40, is it too late for me to realistically change careers? and trained to become a barrister specialising in sports and mediation. Uh, will it be against me, but I'm no longer a young gun? Or will life work experience count favourably? I see so many young people at university, and these days I'm very worried. I won't be able to follow my dream to work in the legal profession. And now that I've graduated, is the SQE the right route to take advantage of um, further towards being able to work as a solicitor or a barrister in the profession? Um, my answer to that question, um, quite <coughs> frankly, is good on you. Um, you've gone out there at 40 years old. You've gained a new skill. You've got loads of drive and ambition. And um, no, not at all. I, my personal thoughts are, and I do get asked this a lot on age, experience, uh, and things like that. I, I, I personally would rather have someone come to my door with a lot of life experience because you someone who might be at university who's young and you know i'm not in any way saying that there's nothing wrong with someone out of university who's a graduate um isn't going to have the life experience um that you've got so i think what you need to to do is maybe sit down and really think about what is it that i gained in these i don't know 20 years since you've been in your career and actually think about how can i apply these moving forwards <coughs> what is it that i can offer um a future employer I've had loads of different jobs over the years and I've I've changed careers many times. I was cabin crew for Virgin Atlantic. I worked for Virgin Atlantic in Heathrow Operations. I was a Met Police officer. I even started out at my late teens performing magic all over um, the country and internationally. And I know um, all too well about um, in, interpersonal, interchangeable skills. Um, I think what the area you are wanting to go into, sports um, and mediation, it's a really <laughs> popular area of law that people want to go into loads of people want to go into sports and we whenever we get a sports role we get a multitude of people who really want to go into that area so what i would say to you is 
is sit down and, and, and give yourself the time to think about what skills is it that I've gained in this year? What is it that you've got that's going to put you ahead of the people that you class as the young guns? Well, I, I can I don't even know you from this question, but I can already say life experience, probably negotiation. There's probably a multitude of skills that you've got to sell yourself in the right way. Like Sean mentioned just um, a moment ago, I think it's really important to start networking with people in that area. Get on LinkedIn, start adding sports partners, start speaking to them, start engaging with them, start asking them questions. Um, uh, and, and I think, again, you'll be surprised um, by the results. Life experience does count. I think you just need to be clear on what it is that, one, you want, how you're going to get it, and give yourself that time to sit down to work out how you're going to market yourself because it's really, really important. Um, when you you mentioned about the SQE, um, the SQE, yeah, it, it, it's worth doing. Um, it, it might help you um, if, if you really want to work as a solicitor or a barrister, but you might want to go in maybe unqualified and go down another route. Um, I think you need to ask yourself the question, what is it that's most important to you here? Are you wanting to be a solicitor in that area of law? Or would you, at the moment, rather than investing your time in the SQE, would you maybe rather go straight into a role, get on the job experience and qualify by a different route? But to answer your question in brief, absolutely not. Opportunity <laughs> exists for anyone at any age. It's just, it, and that's my mindset on things, but it's about how you apply yourself and sell yourself. If you're already in that mindset, that someone isn't going to look at me because I'm older or someone isn't going to consider me, um, you know, because I, I, I'm not as young as other people, then, you, then you're in that wrong mindset. Change that mindset into a value adding <coughs> mindset. How is it you're going to sell yourself? How is it you're going to um, tell a future employer of the value you can add? And I just want to emphasize to people, it's all about adding value. Always be in that mindset when you go into an interview, Think about the value you can add. And if you're talking that language to a potential employer, they're going to look at you as the right sort of person. I'll give you a quick example. You're going to um, an interview and you uh, part of your due diligence on the interview is you start looking at the company or the firm's website. You start looking at things that the company does. Then you go into the interview and they say, tell me a bit about the company. What do you think, Jason? And I say to them, well, actually, I've looked at your website. I can see that you do this. Actually, I've noticed in the social media bit here, I, I was thinking this might be a good idea. This could potentially work. And the employer is going to think this, this is a person I like. He's already starting to apply himself and think in the right way. So adding value is incredibly important. It's not just about being technically great. Technically great is important. But what value do you add? So um, I hope that answers that. I wish you all the best of luck. And I hope you manage to secure the role that you want. Um, so, Sean, another question um, for you. Um, do I need to tailor every cover letter to each job I apply to? Do recruiters read the cover letters? Are they still necessary? I think with this question, I think it depends on the job. Um, I wouldn't say you need to tailor a cover letter for every single job out there, but a well-drafted cover letter, of course, it can sometimes stand you apart, apart from your competition. I think. It depends on the firm and the role. If you're applying directly to a firm, then of course, include a cover letter. I know when you apply to recruiters on some of the job boards, it will ask you to include a cover letter. I'll be honest with you, most recruiters won't read a cover letter top to bottom in the first instance. I think this can be very time consuming. If there are 50 applications for one role and each one of them comes with a detailed cover letter, well, reading through all of those could take up most of your day, which then puts us behind in helping you actually secure your role. So good recruiters will ring you and go through a very detailed registration process. This will then lead to them picking out the key bits of information needed for the application. So if they know the firm and the role well enough, they should be able to guide you as to what information you need to be providing them with to make that application. So once they have those key bits of information, a lot of, well, I know that the good recruiters out there will put together their own form of cover letter, which would be slightly different to the cover letter that you would write yourselves, and then take all the points to make sure that if they are putting you forward for the role, there is a high chance you will secure an interview for that. I think it's, I think recruiters should be honest with you as well on, on that point there and, and not waste any time at all. 
So, yes, if you're applying direct to a firm and they're a firm that wants a cover letter, of course, you have to include a cover letter. If applying to recruiters, I don't think you do need to include a cover letter in that unless you feel there are points that you really want to get out there. Things like Jason said, if there's been if you've got a lot of life experience and there's a lot of things that you want to include in your cover letter, which would stand you apart, then, of course, do it. Other than that, I would be picking up the phone to the recruiter, going through all the details about what it is you've done in your career and getting them to guide you in the right direction with the roles out there and the firms they work with. Great. Thank you very much. Um, right. We're coming to these uh, live questions now. Please do keep them coming in. We're going to get through as many as we can. And there's some really great questions um, <clears throat> coming in. So um, a question here. A lot of firms tend to be focused on up or out. What options are there for lawyers who have mid-level experience, nine to ten years, but perhaps don't want partnership as there are other life focuses, such as starting a family? What would you recommend for someone who is just happy to do the work but is not wanting to become a partner and not wanting to do a lot of business development? It's a great question. And I think a lot of people tend to assume that uh, if you don't go forward with partnership, um, you know, that that is the only career option. And it's not the case. There's so many people out there where partnership isn't for them. Perhaps they don't want to lead a department. Perhaps they don't want to manage people. And that, that doesn't mean um, that that's the end of your career. There's still a load of options out there. Um, one thing we do tend to find that a lot of um, working parents tend to like is PSLs, or, uh, PSL, professional support lawyer, or um, um, what, what? how else do you describe them? Knowledge so, lawyer. No, knowledge lawyer, yeah. that's the word I'm looking for. I had a mind block there. Um, knowledge lawyer roles and they tend to be quite good because one um, quite often they tend to be part-time roles um, secondly they tend to be quite flexible on hours so they tend to um, align themselves around um, school hours um, and um, generally they tend to be quite nice roles um, if you don't know what a knowledge lawyer is I'm sure um, quite a lot of people here do they, they generally go away do all the research on new legislation they train the team they make sure everyone's up to date on um, any changes to the law, etc., And those roles tend to be nice roles. There's still um, a multitude of, of different opportunities out there. You could even still just stay as a fear that's servicing the work that comes in. Perhaps you maybe really enjoy um, the client aspect of the role or just servicing the work in itself. And there's nothing wrong with that all the time. We, um, all the time we um, uh, get candidates who call us but just want to move roles at maybe 10, 11, 12 years PQE. You might also find as well um, in-house, there could be opportunities for you there as well. Nine, 10 years is a really good level of PQE for in-house roles. That tends to be a lot of the time where the kind of sweet spot is for experience that a lot of in-house companies want. Um, I think maybe what I would advise you is, is to think about if, if the priority here, okay, is the family. What is it that you're really wanting to do internally? Because if it is still the pressure of fee earning is too much, um, and maybe you want a role that is different, then you need to think about what you know where is that role going to be because some in-house roles um you know can can equally be demanded but actually other in-house roles can offer flexi time and limited annual leave it, it really depends on the company that you're going to but just because you won't, don't want to be a part that there's still a multitude of opportunity out there um sean i think you have a couple of points to add to this one yeah i do i think um that this is something that's got quite a lot especially in what I've been doing over the last few years. And there's a lot of firms out there who have actually put career paths in place for individuals that don't necessarily want to become partners. So there's quite a few firms out there um, who, and the titles are um, sort of legal director or another title like that. So what this does is gives you progression, but also gives you the opportunity to have a lot more flexibility where you don't have the responsibilities of being a partner, but you're still at the same level in terms of seniority. So you are looked at as a partner, but then you don't have to do all the other things around being a partner with some firm, firm such as partners meetings and all the other things that you may not want to do or you may not get time to do. So I think the legal world is changing. I know a lot of firms were sort of behind the curve. I think a lot of them are now catching up and getting ahead of the curve. So these things will be changing and I'm seeing and having a lot of conversations with a lot of firms out there and with the team as well, where firms are actually asking us what they need to do to attract individuals like this, because they don't always want partners in their teams. If they've got someone of this level of experience who's very good at the job, but only wants to work three or four days a week, well, that can add loads of value to the department. So 
there's there's plenty of opportunity out there for, for some of that level. Great advice. You're on a roll, uh, Sean. There's another question for you. Um, what alternative career paths are there for lawyers in the property dispute sector? Are you seeing uh, more in the way of in-house roles? Yeah, this is something I've been asked before, actually, and I have placed lawyers in-house in property litigation. I think, well, the first point would be what sort of property litigation are you doing? I think that's something important to know before we can potentially help you. But there's plenty of businesses out there that will need somebody in-house because if you if you look, and obviously there's probably going to be a lot more of this work coming up, so it's probably quite timely, but there's a lot of um, businesses and housing associations, et cetera, out there who do outsource a lot of property litigation work. And some of the numbers that I've I've heard, you're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of fees a year. So my advice to them has been, well, why don't you get somebody in-house who could do that work and then delegate work to firms as and when needed and a lot of businesses you'll be surprised they don't think about this they don't realize oh if i get somebody in house they could do the job and then we can have support of law firms when i need it so there are a lot of roles out there i think one thing i see and one thing that's quite common with um, property disputes lawyers is when i have conversations with them they do say to me well i don't see many in-house roles well we do work on in-house roles and i think again it goes back to building your network if you have a strong enough network and you're all people and the right businesses as well then the right role will come up i think it is a competitive a competitive area when it comes to um sort of people applying for roles in property disputes but there are roles out there and you can take an in-house role i think it's just aligning yourself with the right business where there's a good flow of work and it's not somewhere where one day you're busy and the next day you're sort of twiddling your thumbs but again if you align yourself with a good recruiter then of course they can they can help point you in the right direction Totally agree with that. Um, next question. Um, I'm an Indian qualified lawyer with a master's in LLM from Queen Mary's University in London. I have two years of Indian work experience in direct taxes, insolvency, bankruptcy and arbitration. In a post-Brexit UK under the new points-based system as a non-EU national, what, does some, what chances uh, <coughs> does someone like me stand to secure a paralegal role? Any tips you can provide in that direction, please? Uh, it's a great question. It's a question we've been asked a lot recently. Um, I think um, the first thing you need to do is I, I would be building up your experience personally in India and getting as much experience as you possibly can. Because if you're going to come over to the UK, I'm assuming, and I'm not an immigration specialist, I'll add that now, you're going to need to get sponsorship from an employer. So you're going to need to have something um, special to offer an employer. But all the time, there's a lot of big firms in London who uh, sponsoring people is second nature to them. It, it, it's a usual process and it's something they do all the time. We often see people coming over from all over the world into different roles where sponsorship is an option. But those candidates <coughs> always have something that the firm wants. It might be that candidate's got experience in the Middle East working on a market and this firm's doing a lot of work over there. Or, you know, I think you've got to have something to offer the firm, because if someone is going to go out there and sponsor you, that 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 generally is a fair bit of work. So I think you've got to have a great skill set to offer. <clears throat> but I'd really think about what is it that you can offer a company in the UK? Um, and then once you, you've kind of got that sketched out, then start to kind of think of a plan of how you can um, get over <clears throat> here. And, it, and what you might even find is a good option um, is maybe look for a law firm in India um that is has also got offices in the uk or look for a company in india that's got offices in the uk then see if you can transfer internally um and that's probably actually the quickest route to get over um to the uk is is to take a route like that try and find a company that's um got strong ties to the uk and then make <clears> a case <throat> internally to move across and generally, I think if um, you know you've got a lot of value, any company is going to rather you want to move internally than to lose you altogether. Um, Sean, question um, for you here. Um, good morning. I've had a career break and I'm looking to return to law in a different field, private client. I used to be a conveyancer. I'm currently studying the STEP diploma to give me some relevant skills. Uh, great diploma to have, um, but unsure how to go about obtaining <coughs> practical experience. Any advice, think, please? Yeah, I think there's another question as well that I've seen that says, and this will I can answer both in one go here. 
Fantastic. Do you see many senior lawyers moving specialism? If so, what are the key ways to get a new firm slash company to look at your CV? So I think um, we'll start with, yes, we do see senior lawyers moving specialism. I think we see it more often in the regions than we do in London. So I think if you are a private client, or if you are a conveyancer, sorry, looking to move into private client, I'm not going to lie, it can be difficult. Of course it can. I think obviously doing this, the, the step diploma is important and it will help you gain skills. But I think what a lot of firms do, and it's, it's something that they've done for years, is obviously if you are to apply for a role, um, and somebody else applies for a role who's got more training, then obviously they're going to potentially look at the other person more favorably. But I think what you need to be prepared for, if you are a senior lawyer or you are an experienced lawyer in another field looking to move into private client or any other area, you need to be prepared that you'll be going in as an NQ. So your salary may be different. You'll be going in at a completely different level. You'll be starting from the bottom again. If it's something you're willing to do, then absolutely fine. Um, but it's something you need to consider before doing that because I've seen it happen before where a senior lawyer moves over to a different um, specialism and then they're treated as, as a junior lawyer because you will be a junior lawyer. You may have experience of doing things like wills and probate in, in the past, but if you don't have up-to-date experience, then you need to be prepared for that. But I think it's definitely doable. You can do it if it's something you're passionate about and you want to move across, then of course, give it a go. And how would you do that then? My advice again would be to keep an eye out on opportunities out there. The private client, or the just private client in general, is getting busy. Of course, since the pandemic started, it's been one of the busiest areas. Um, so align yourself with with people in private client. Make sure you grow your LinkedIn network. Make sure you're reaching out to people. If you see an opportunity with a recruiter that's that's at the junior level, and you feel like it's something you want to pursue, then then ring them, speak to them about having conversations with. The recruiters and the firms you're never going to know if you can secure a role in that area so you need to be having conversations my advice would be to be on the phone not to be hiding behind emails as well it's something that um i see often is um people are emailing about roles and will i be right for this well if we've never spoken i can't actually answer that question you need to speak to me and tell me who you are and why you want to do that and all these things that then i can go out there and, and point you in the right direction but yes it's doable it's hard but you need to find the right opportunity and, and somewhere where they're forward thinking. And like Jason said, where they're willing to take somebody on who has more life experience, et cetera, and change disciplines. But it can happen. And I think just to add to that as well, don't be afraid to get on the phone. I think what Sean's saying um, is key that I think we live in a digital age now where people always go as their first approach to sending an email, sending a message. That, that, that's all well and good. And I appreciate, um, you know, picking up the phone sometimes and phoning someone direct can seem a bit scary, but actually it makes you stand out because so few people do it now. Most people's uh, way of making an introduction is to do, um, is to send an email. I'm a big believer that whatever the crowd does, you want to do the opposite um, because that's what's going to make you stand out. Obviously within reason, I'm sure there's caveats to that very wide and open-ended <laughs> statement, but you want to make yourself stand out and um, you know, you've got to think about brand you. You've got to think about your personal brand as an individual and how you're going to kind of grow that. I know we keep coming back on this uh, webinar to LinkedIn, um, but it's really important. Um, some really great questions coming in. Please do continue to submit them. We're going to get through as many as we can. I think we're on a roll now, Sean. Um, right. The next question. Um, I'm a trainee accountant, but I'm planning on changing career. I want to enter the legal industry. Do you have any tips on guidance on how to do this? Um, so I would say that there's big similarities um, between um, accountancy firms and um, law firms. So it's not like you're moving away um, to kind of a, a, a completely different world. There, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the structure, the way the businesses operate, the fact that they're partnerships, and the fact that you're giving people professional advice in what is a regulated industry. Um, so if, if you want to change industries to get into legal, um, obviously, I don't know what your qualifications are uh, and so on. But a good route in for you might be to go into a firm as a paralegal, but go to a progressive, a, a progressive firm, which will give you the opportunity to perhaps do the, the ILEX, the legal executive um, course. Because the great thing with the ILEX is you can qualify by on the job experience. Yes, there are a number of exams that come with that. Um, but the, the good thing about the ILEX is 
one, you're getting paid, you're getting on the job experience at the same time. And once you've become qualified um, with the ILEX, you can apply to the SRA um, to become a qualified solicitor. And the great thing about that is that I really like people who qualify through ILEX or people that have been previously legal secretaries, as you uh, pro probably tended to notice from my answer to my previous question, people who've worked in the industry for a long time and then got qualified by on the job experience, I tend to find a really, really good candidates. And I have a lot of success placing candidates like that. Um, I think what you want to do again is think about what skills have you got while working um, as a training accountant? Are you having client contact? What sort of um, advice are you giving to people? And think about the transferable skills that you've picked up that you can apply um, to the legal industry. I don't think it's that much of a difficult move. I think if you've got the right mindset and you're um, if you've got the right mindset and and you're clever in how you apply for the role. So you, uh, and it might even be uh, this is kind of where a cover letter probably would come in helpful because of the fact that if your CV just arrives in um, a partner's inbox in a law firm with no explanation to the fact that you, you, you know, you want to move into legal, the partner's going to be thinking, well, you know, this, this CV isn't relevant to us. So you, it's your job to show why it's relevant and it's your job to kind of, you know, really flush, uh, flesh that out um, to the person. But I don't think it should be that much of a difficult move. I think there's a big similarities between um, the sectors. Sean, a uh, question for you. Hello, I am trained in private practice and qualified uh, into commercial. Upon qualification, um, I went in-house. However, I now wish to return to private practice. So I'm three and a half years qualified and I'm finding it very difficult getting a foothold. Uh, is it unrealistic to expect that I can return after this amount of time? I have found many recruiters to be quite dismissive about the prospect. Well, I think first first of all, with that question, it, I think, again, it'd be good to know the sort of in-house role that you're doing and, and the type of work you're dealing with. I think one thing that tends to happen with commercial lawyers moving in house is you, you tend to become more of a generalist. So you start picking up things all over. So whether that's corporate, commercial, litigation, whatever it may be, employment, you start picking up or you take on a really varied role, which is fine. I think if you want to move back into private practice, it can be done because I've done it. I've done it multiple times. I've helped people move from in-house to private practice and vice versa. At three and a half years qualified, you're sort of at the sweet spot area where a lot of firms in London are looking for somebody of that level of PQE because that sits nicely between the NQs, one-year PQEs, and also the partners in the departments. I think if you're struggling to find a foothold, it's probably due to the market, I imagine. One thing that I see quite often is recruiters can be quite dismissive. And many conversations I've had previously about recruiters being dismissive will, dismissive will be due to the current market. So the market changes all the time. Of course it does. And if you're in a if you practice in commercial and it's not really that busy or it's not a buoyant area in the market at the moment then recruiters will be dismissive they will want to be talking to the right people which i think in my view and i, and I think jason taught me this as well when i first started in recruitment it's you need to speak with, with as many people as you can and make sure you're doing the best job you possibly can and pointing everybody in the right direction because there will come a time where the right role will be there for you and I think if those recruiters aren't having that, those conversations with you, then you will be missing out on the right opportunities. But you can move back into private practice. I think you really need to consider the move back to private practice because a lot of firms will also look at the fact that you haven't been, you haven't had a billable hours target, et cetera, as well. And that's one thing that's really important because it can be a big change. If you moved over upon qualification, then you haven't done a full year or two as a fee owner in private practice. So some firms will look at that. But I think if you align yourself with the right recruiter or you keep an eye out for the right roles and the right role will come along. And if, I think one thing you need to do as well is um, make sure your CV is very detailed. So make sure there's good facts and the, the points that are, will, sell, will sell you and stand you apart. Because I'm sure if you're working in house, you're going to have dealt with work that's very different to a lot of lawyers working in private practice. So get all those things on your CV. If you've got really strong selling points on there, then recruiters may not be as dismissive and you may be able to then start finding the right role and securing more interviews as well. Great, thank you. Um, so th there's a great question here. Hi, I'm a private client solicitor in London with three years PQE. At this stage of my career, I've been looking for a mentor. How does one go about finding one? Now, uh, there's an interesting story actually about mentors, and I, I do speak about this on the Career Success Podcast, not that I keep plugging this podcast, but it is a great series. Um, I wish I'd actually found a mentor. I, I got 
probably um, four years into running my business uh, before I actually ever thought of reaching out to someone more experienced than me um, for advice. And you know, I know this isn't necessarily everyone's situation, but on reflection now, I think back and think, why did I not reach out to someone more experienced and have a mentor? What I had to do was learn a lot of very hard mistakes um, along the way in business. Um, and mentors are so, so, so important. I think everybody should make steps to try and find a mentor. And, and a mentor is a personal thing. And a mentor is very different to a trainer. A mentor is someone who's gonna take you under their wing and give you lots of help and advice and guide you on the right path. And um, I, I wish I'd kind of thought of that actually sooner. I don't know why I never thought of even reaching out to someone more experienced. I think I, I was in the mindset of tackling every problem by myself. But I think, how do you find a mentor? I think it's a very personal thing. I, I don't think there's any one place to go to look for one. Maybe if you're a private client um, lawyer, is it you want to be mentored by someone more senior in private client? Or is it you want more of a sort of a life development coach um, or someone that specializes in helping people build their careers? It might be a private client partner isn't the right person for you to bring out the best in you. I think the kind of question to ask yourself when it comes to a mentor is to think about what is it that I actually feel I need to develop? What is What journey is it I need to go on? What is it that I feel... Um, you know, can be offered to me and actually start reaching out to people. It could be you reach out to partners. It might be there's someone internally in your own organization. But I think by going to events and there's a multitude of events um, out there which you can go to to network, even during these times of um, lockdown, um, there's actually I actually think as a result of lockdown, the world has become more accessible than ever. And I found myself going to events in New York, in different countries, uh, the top uh, high ends of Scotland. And actually, there's a great opportunity now if you use this time right to actually get out there and meet people. But I think a mentor is a very personal thing. I think it's something that you need to really um, kind of meet different people and find out who's right for you. And actually, I have a couple of different mentors now and people I take different experience from. One amazing woman um, I know is a lady called Laura Di Benedetto, um, who wrote a book called The Six Habits. She's in Hawaii and she really helps me, even though I've never met her personally, she really helps to bring out the, the, the best qualities of me as a leader. So I think everyone should think about getting a mentor because it can really help you in life and it can really help fast track you. So I think that's a great question. Um, Sean, question um, for you now. I'm a recently qualified solicitor, trained mm -hmm. and have had several years paralegal experience in small high street firms. My goal is to move to a city commercial corporate sector role, but it seems uh, most prefer experience from a similar firm. Um, how do I go about securing such jobs? We get this question very often. Um, yeah. so I'm sure you're used to answering this one. <laughs> I am. I am I'm very used to answering this question. I think, the fir well, firstly, I think you need to manage your own expectations. I think you're right in saying a lot of these firms do prefer to take on candidates with similar experience. I think the reason for that is because they don't have to train them as much. The level of the transaction is larger, the size of the teams is different, the sort of clients you're dealing with is completely different. Naturally, at that level of peak, you're in a city, you're not going to have a client facing role. And I think my advice here would be to, I think, forget about the larger city firms in the first instance. I think you want to take a step from a small high street firm to say, a, a mid-sized West End firm, potentially, where they deal with good quality work, where you're going to have one-on-one um, -on -one time with the partners in the department, the senior associates in the department, because what you'll naturally find is a lot of these partners in, in the West End, and when I say West End, I don't necessarily mean just focus on West End. There's firms in the city that have a West End profile to them, but these the, the lawyers they have would have worked in the city, so the skills they have and they've picked up over the years, what they'll be able to teach you will be at the level of those in the city so you need and this goes back to what i said earlier about a career plan you need to look at your five to ten year career plan are you going to go from a small high street firm to a magic circle firm no that's not going to happen but what you can do is go from one firm take a step up then a couple of years later take another step up and then once you're at the well, once you're two steps up that should then be able to put you in a position where you can then look at going to the city firm. but what you might find by then as well is you don't actually want to go to a larger city firm. I think a lot of lawyers have a dream or have this, this vision that going there will be the right place for them. It's not right for everybody. That's why there's so many different firms all over the place. I think 
taking that step is, is important. Do that first. And again, how you do that is is by speaking with the right people, connecting with the right people and, and looking for the right opportunities. And then it will put you in a good position in a few years time to know whether you do want to make that step. And you should be able to make that step and it'd be a lot more comfortable than it would if you did that now as well. Great, yeah, great, great answer. Um, question here, hi, I'm a, I am a uh, consultant slash locum and have been for many years, and I've also set up in-house departments and wish to remain as a consultant on a contract basis. How can I stand out from those who are not um, uh, kind of on, I guess what you're trying to say is those who have a permanent CV? Um, I, I think the clue is in the title here. You've said yourself, you're a consultant and locum, and you've spent many years um, setting up departments and working um, in those um, different roles. I, I think don't don't try and be something that you're not. You're not a permanent candidate and permanent candidates are very different to contract candidates. But what you are is you are a specialist and, you, and you've said here you want to continue to be a contract candidate. So what you need to do is get the strongest contract CV. You are an expert at coming into businesses, being parachuted in and having to just rock up on day one and pick up maybe a caseload, you're having to come in and just pick up the way things work. And actually, I really do take my hat off to contractors because a lot of the time you're coming in, you haven't had an induction, you haven't had kind of all the things that normally go with a permanent induction, and you're used to just coming on, sometimes thinking on your feet. So I think what you need to do is just sell yourself as what you are. You are a contractor and you are an expert at coming in and helping businesses that need a helping hand. So what I do tend to find, though, and a bit of advice for contractors is sometimes their CVs can get so, so, so big because they put every single role on there. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes I think I, I think you need to think about how is it that I can make myself stand out as a contractor? What point is it that I can put on the top, which are my headline points? What I would probably do as a contract CV is I would have all of your uh, roles, different dates at the bottom. And it's something you're always going to have to keep updated. But at the top, have the skill sets that you've got, the achievements that you've got at the top, what you actually do. So that's what stands out because on a permanent CV, it's very different. On a permanent CV, someone is going to really look in detail at the roles. Yes, that does happen on a contract CV, but the difficulty is if you're in one role for three months, another for six months, it's going to become so um, congested, that CV. So I think you need to think about what, at the end of the day, the CV is a document to sell you. It serves no other purpose than to sell you. So I think you need to think about as a contractor, how is it that I can showcase and sell my experience? And I think it's, it's a case of structuring the CV in the right way. Your CV might even turn into that of a mini portfolio. I'm a contractor who specializes in being parachuted in to help in-house departments. Um, and and that's, that's, that's your CV, so to speak. Um, but, you know, I think don't try and compete against permanent candidates. You're not a permanent candidate. You're an expert at being parachuted in. So I think that's what to focus on. Um, right. We, we've got another 10 minutes. Let's try and crack through as many as we can, Sean. Right. Hello. I have left an in-house. Um, I've left an in-house financial services role after 18 years and took a career break um, for a fam for, the, for a rest and family. Um, after two plus years, I'm ready for a new role. How best should I market myself? Are there any considerations taking into account I have not been working? Are the best roles really hidden or not advertised? I think we've worked with a number of, of candidates who have taken career breaks. And I think it's quite common, especially after that length of time. I don't think there's any issues with that. I don't think it sets you back at all. I think with all of the experience you have, that's a real selling point. So going back to what Jason said, you obviously need to really sell yourself on on your cv if you're ready to look for a new role i think i would be if i was you i'd market yourself as someone with with experience of 18 years and all the and you need to obviously make it clear of all the experience that you do have so obviously in the financial services sector if you're looking for a new role if you want to change sort of the sort of um business you're working for it can be done i think it's just about the right role come along at the right time so I would just get all the selling points down, especially on your LinkedIn, on your CV, and make sure you're aligning yourself with the right recruiters who can keep you in the loop with the right roles that are coming through. 
Um, I don't think you need to worry about too much about having not worked. I think some of the best candidates I've worked with have taken a year or two break and, and firms are crying out and businesses as well, crying out for the skills that they have. So I wouldn't see that necessarily as an issue. I wouldn't worry too much about that as well. Are the are the best roles really hidden and not advertised? No, that that's not that's not true. I think sometimes if we have a bank of candidates, say ten or fifteen candidates who are all looking for a commercial in a house role, and a role comes in, and we already have fifteen candidates perfect for that role, then we're not going to advertise that role because we can just get to work on talk with the candidates we've already had conversations with, but. I don't think the best roles are hidden. I mean, if they are, then maybe I don't know about it, but it wouldn't make it wouldn't make much sense for them to be hidden in, in my eyes because if, if businesses and firms are trying to attract the right candidates, having a hidden role, just you, you're just not going to help. Maybe they have in-house teams who go out and approach specific candidates with LinkedIn searches. I think that's slightly different to, to the role. I think the hidden. only time that does apply, Sean, on that particular point, is where a firm maybe is going out to market with a very discreet yeah. assignment or retainer. Example being firm wants to get a new partner but doesn't want the whole market knowing about it. And that's more of what I would call a retained yeah. headhunt search. But, uh, you know, again, th that role isn't hidden. Someone is working on it and going out and approaching people. So I think that's where LinkedIn, having all the correct information, is so important because there could be a role out there which is perfect for you where a business or a firm is searching for or an agency and because you don't have the relevant things on your linkedin you're not coming up, up on the linkedin searches it's crazy the amount of candidates that don't have their linkedin profiles yeah. marked correctly or have their practice areas on there you know you get um lawyers who just have lawyer or solicitor on their linkedin profiles and the problem with that is if you don't have the practice area you don't appear in our searches when we're looking for you. And the candidates that have their profiles keyword optimized the best. And it, it, it's crazy, actually. Sometimes when we go on to LinkedIn, um, it's the same candidates that always come up the top of our search because they've optimized their profiles correctly. Right. Um, let's try and um, answer uh, at least a couple more, Sean. Right. Um, good morning. I mainly practice immigration. I would like to move to family law. I've studied family law in the LPC. And I've dealt with some non mall and divorce cases. How do I move to family law? Really common question, how to move practice areas. It's not easy. It's very difficult. Um, the easiest way to move practice areas is internally in your own firm um, to um, speak internally and say you want to move to that department or, or try and deal with a mixed case load, which it sounds like you've had some experience. But what you need to do is to try and swing your caseload um, over to be more family law. It doesn't even matter if your caseload is only 50-50. That's probably enough for you to come to the market with to look for a new role on the basis that you want to specialise in it um, properly. But if you've got zero experience in the practice area you want to move to, it's very, very, very difficult. What you would need to probably do is start networking in that area, then make the move over um and try and get to know people in the sector um so um uh, what i would say is try and get more experience you've got to ask yourself a question if the firm aren't willing to give you that experience would they rather lose you which is potentially the risk they run if that's not what you want to do rather than keep you um so sean question for you um how uh, do firms see someone who wants to move from working in regional, um, in a regional international law firm uh, to a London law firm? Are there any prejudices um, or false myths? This is something I've dealt with quite a lot as well previously. So I think it, the move can be quite simple. I think a lot of the, the firms in London do obviously send a lot of work out to the regions. I think that's common. They do that because the charge out rate is naturally lower and they can then deal with more of the juicy work in their city of London offices where it makes sense to do that where the lawyers tend to be paid a lot more so they need to obviously get a lot more for uh for their money realistically i think make a, you, you've got relevant skills you're dealing with really good quality work most of the time i think firms in london are looking for people like that there are a short a sh well there is a shortage of certain skills in london at any one time it's, I've seen the market change so much in my time where at points there's I've worked on 40 corporate roles at any one time. There's only been two corporate lawyers on the market. So uh, I think 
the move can be done. It can be done quite simple. Again, align yourself with the right recruiter. Keep an eye out for the right roles. But just because you're working in a regional office of an international law firm, I don't think there's any issues with that. You can make the move to London and, and candidates, and lawyers in general, do that all of the time. It's just about timing. Most of these things are about timing, but the right role will come along. There, there aren't any false myths, I don't think. I, I don't see that. I think if, if, you're at, if you're in a regional office of a city firm and you move to London, I've seen that sometimes that doesn't work as well. I think moving to a London team, the, the culture may be different or the team may be different, the dynamic may be different. So they, you may be pushed out slightly. It's happened. Obviously, it's not nice that it happened, but it does happen. I think moving to another firm, it should be absolutely fine. I think you just need to invest in yourself and be ready for, well, be ready to hit the ground running because naturally, like I said, it can be a lot more demanding in those offices, but there shouldn't be any issues with it. Okay, I'm going to take this one last um, question. Hi, I am being made redundant as a conveyancing solicitor of 10 years PQE+. Plus. Unfortunately, I am disabled with MS. Um, how do I put my skills forward and make my disability um, irrelevant? Um, I, I think don't even uh, think about the disability. Just get your skills down on paper um, and, and and sell yourself in the right way. Um, you know, there's been there's there's a lot of legislation out there um, in regards to people um, who have disabilities. But you know, if it's not preventing you in any way moving forward with your career, don't let that hold you back and get in a mindset that you know you're not able to get the role um, or, or whatever because of that reason. We have candidates all the time who approach us with different disabilities, different things that they need to have accommodate them. And don't let that in any way hold you back. Just go out there, sell your skills um, and and be uh, the best that you can possibly be. Unfortunately, it's 11 o'clock and um, I'm going to get in um, trouble if I run over. I'm really sorry we didn't get a chance um, to get through all the questions. We gave it our absolute best shot. Please do connect with us on LinkedIn, um, Sean Nicholson or Jason Connolly, or you could go to our website, uh, www.jmc-legal.com. Um, if you do have a burning question, do feel free to just submit it um, to our emails. We will come back to you. It might not be immediately, but we will come back to you. It's been an absolute delight. Thanks to the Law Society for having us this morning. We hope to do another one of these again soon. And thank you all for joining us and best of luck in your careers. Thank you.